I'd like you to also perhaps look into what exactly Bitcoin has ahead of us in the future. So please uh, join me in welcoming Amin. Yes. Hi, welcome. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, to speak in front of you all. Uh, I guess this is the first time I'm speaking in front of a purely corporate audience. And it's always interesting for me to get the perspective of such an audience because of the, I guess, diluted perspective of what the media puts out, what blockchain is. You know, I've been involved with the industry for the past three years. I've spoken at numerous conferences and I always um, uh, puzzled by the information that people uh, pass on to me as what they believe is happening in the blockchain and Bitcoin world. Um, just to start off, I worked as a journalist for over a year and a half, um, numerous articles in different topics of the Bitcoin and blockchain industry. When I speak about blockchain, just keep in mind that there are over probably 500 or close to a thousand different coins out there, and each have a different uh, use and purpose. So don't just think of it as Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first, but it has been replicated over and over for different purposes. Um, so the blockchain in that essence has also been replicated for different purposes. So to start off, um, Oh, I didn't know. I just want to show you this quick video just to put things in a bit of perspective. If you're one of them, you can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. <laughs> Just what is this main artery of the information superhighway? Every business, no matter how large, no matter how small, will be on the internet in the year 2000. It's the primary way that people will look up information. It will replace the yellow pages as we know it today. Are a lot of people just getting on to the internet because they feel that they have to get onto the playing field, so to speak? But it's very hip to be on the internet right now. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC GE com. I mean. Well, well, Allison should know. What, what is internet that anyway? Internet is uh, the massive computer right. network. The one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big? What do you, how does one, what, do you, what do you write to it? Like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC <laughs> writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Uh, <laughs> oh. I'm afraid that if I subscribe to something like internet, he would really be hooked. I would get hooked and I would never you know, spend time with my family. Do you well, and also, it, do you, does it bother you at all that these are all people that you don't really know? I mean, that everybody's you know, signing on and having these conversations and whining together or griping together or whatever. To, with people that, I mean, I, I don't know. If I, it is group therapy of the, of the 90s. So. Well, I just, as I mentioned, I have no desire to be a part of the internet because I feel like I'm so inundated with information um, all the time. I'll stop the video there I don't, that's really, just I don't to... want more. Don't you ever feel Not like into the talk. But this pretty much gives you an example of how people view Bitcoin and blockchain today in comparison to what they viewed the internet back in 1994. So you can really put this into perspective, you know, something that was so bizarre to them and something that was so mysterious and couldn't even define it in the moment is now in our pockets and everywhere available. And especially in a country like Netherlands, you know, you can go to cities where they have uh, free Wi-Fi throughout the entire city, such as Utrecht, Amsterdam, I think then half is it as well. Um, so the concept behind it is allowing people to receive a reward for keeping the network alive. So that, that's in the purest form I can put it. So prior to this, there were examples of decentralized storage, decentralized, you know, a lot, a lot of numerous different uh, aspects. But the issue was that people weren't getting rewarded. So they would contribute to the network out of the kindness of their heart or in the belief that this will excel into the future. But Bitcoin took this away. It used human psychology of needing uh, of the greed aspect of psychology and rewarding them for keeping a network alive. And this changed the complete game. So to give you an example, sorry, I'm not sure why, but the button doesn't do this. Yeah, okay. Um, so Vitalik is the creator of uh, Ethereum, you know, a very intelligent person if you've ever had a chance to speak to him. And, you know, the, the, the concept of being able to downgrade from a central aspect you know if you, if you look at a server data center for example you have running cars such as administrators cooling cars electric uh, electric cars 
the location itself and redundancy, backup, etc., etc. If you allow all these cards to come into the way, you actually understand very easily why there's such a high markup on uh, cloud storage or uh, VPS or anything else like that. So storage is a great example of how they have attempted to. So I'm not having much fun with this button. Okay, um, storage has really taken this concept and said, okay, instead of using data centers, why don't we use people's uh, computers at their homes? So everyone has a computer, and very rarely do they fill it up to its full capacity. So if you tap into this resource and extract it, and in a way provide a service that allows you to, instead of being able to download files from data centers, you can download it instead from maybe your neighbor or person sitting next to you. You change the paradigm of what sharing files and what storage is. And in that concept, you you excel to a point where you reduce cost because you no longer need data centers. You introduce encryption so you don't need to trust uh, iCloud or Google Drive to secure your data and keep it there. And all of those that I just named, by the way, have been hacked and files have been released. And this is purely for the concept of central trust. Okay, there we go. And you can see that if you rely on a single point of trust, you have a single point of failure. If you distribute this amongst thousands, if not millions of different people, it will become exponentially harder to break through and uh, you know, break the encryption or to be able to hack into the system or anything like that. And storage does this in a very, very uh, genius way. You know, they, they did their beta testing very well. They passed it all and now they're open to public. And they've tested the function of this up to two terabytes. And Prior to that, they reached 10% of Dropbox in 2012. So now, just imagine that. Imagine that a company in 2012 like Dropbox, they matched that 10% in capacity by using decentralized storage of people's computers at home. Now, this is a completely shift in paradigm of storage. And what I want to really put out is you know, a lot of people come to me and they say, Bitcoin, oh, in the future maybe, but this is happening now. This has been happening for the past three years. You can go online and use the storage platform to store files in a way that you couldn't do before. And if you look at the concept of Bitcoin, you have a private key and a public key. So your private key allows you to have ownership over files. You no longer have a middleman in the process. So the whole concept of decentralization and Bitcoin is to remove the middleman. And you no longer have to worry about trust because you have the key. So imagine uh, in the sense of sharing a file. I choose who I share the file with. Only the person that I share it with will have access to it. No one else will have that unless they have my private key. So if you look at it and you apply this to other aspects of life, so for example, medical records or other things, only the doctor that you give permission to will have access to your files or have access to your records. And that's a much, much better approach than the centralized method of let's just put it all out there and any doctor with access can access all your private files. You know, it's a completely shift in privacy and um, how you deal with uh, the world around you. And I, I really like this quote from the IBM chairman in 1943. Um, again, this puts into perspective, you know, a lot of people today come up and speak about Bitcoin as though they know what's going to happen. You know, if you go back 10 years or 15 years, could you have guessed that Facebook be around? Could you have guessed that millions of people around the world would be interacting and having relationships, even getting married, or perhaps in some cases even divorced because of Facebook? You know, th these ideas didn't exist. And to s pretend like we know what's going to happen from here is, I, I would say, to look into it a bit more before commenting on such a thing. Anyway, so bring it back to BitNation. Um, we started about, I would say, less than a year ago. And through that time, we've accumulated a lot of users from around the world who are uh, supporting the cause of a decentralized governance. So it's not, it's not an attack of the existing governance, but it's merely an input of how things could be done a bit differently. You know, taking the weight off the government and allowing a decentralized platform to deal with people's uh, you know, land registration, birth certificate, uh, marriage certificate, and things like that. We've actually done a wedding on the blockchain. So we've had audiences live stream the video and then you lodge it onto the blockchain by notarizing the document. And this process is much simpler than the current institutional uh, approach. So th the reason it gives us the power, if there are any lawyers in here, they would probably already know this, or politicians or anything like that. Self-determination is a law that allows nations to create their own rules. And you are, by international law, allowed to create your own system of rules, even if it's your own. Um, and this is what gives the nation and states their power. So using the same concept, using the same rule, you know, we can apply it to decentralized governance. And there's nothing, obviously, wrong with it because it's by law. So using the same concept, we can create, you know, uh, 
smaller nations and allow people to govern themselves in smaller groups. And I think that's a much more natural way of approaching the situation rather than pretending, you know, certain rules apply to millions of people at the same time. And that's how it should be. So it's, it's in the same way that businesses, for example, I think 98% of startups fail. And the ones that do succeed have something special to offer. So why don't we apply the same concept to governments? You know, so why don't we have hundreds of different uh, privatized or even public uh, companies or whatever it is providing governance services? And we'll see who does a better job rather than you know having one or two to choose from. And it completely changes the game because you have a different system of evolution in that case. You have a different system of how things are suggested and evolved. And this is just something we did for the refugee crisis last year, um, well it's still obviously going on, but we're able to put up a website where people can put locations where it's dangerous, where they may be able to avoid minefields, etc., places to sleep, and where they've had issues, and share this data. So distributing the data among users is a very useful aspect to this. Um, and if you really look at it, is it, there's two billion people in the world that are unbanked. And if you take this economy, it would be the second largest economy after the USA. And these people don't have access to banking facilities. So imagine they suddenly can purchase things online. Suddenly they can tap into the financial economy. And imagine the effect this would have. We're talking about the second largest economy on the planet, you know, that don't even have access to this. And that's just the citizenship we did on the blockchain. And we're working on creating, a, you know, following the European standards of uh, identification and creating our own ID system, which should be able to be used within the Schengen area. Um, so yeah, the whole concept of this is that you know we traveled from a path where we had single sources of news, so newspapers, televisions, and we would gather our information from these places. So suddenly, with the introduction of social media and the distribution of the internet. The, the content became greater than the source. You know, there's so many bloggers now that produce very quality, you know, very high quality information that people really enjoy reading. YouTube, you allow people from their homes to become stars rather than needing to go through the traditional system. As long as they you know, interact with the audience and they appreciate it. The best example I can ever give about open source versus closed source you know, is Linux versus Microsoft. Um, and I cannot put it in a better way. If you look at Windows, how many applications there are for it, and then if you look at Linux, which is purely open source and free, freely available software, that gets used in, you know, from simple applications to one of the most important, such as satellites and other aspects of hospital machines and stuff. And it's all through the same kernel. You know, it's not like Windows where you have to, you know, change it all around from, depending on the application that's being used. And this is a purely, I think, more succinct way of really putting this whole. Uh, image for you because that's how it works. So in innovation, you, you always try and use existing technologies to promote new technologies. So people are used to it. They know how to interact with ATMs. They know how to interact with cards, and they know how to interact with you know things that they've grown up using. So why not use those same technologies and promote such things as Bitcoin and other cryptos? So Wirex really does a great job of that. You know, it, it takes the Bitcoin system and it attaches it to the Mastercard system. So it allows you to top up your Bitcoin, for example, and use the card, and use the card anywhere that Mastercard is uh, accepted. So what does this do? It removes the barrier of uh, knowing the knowledge of how to use Bitcoin. So all you need to know then is just log onto their system. Someone from overseas can send you Bitcoins, and then you load it onto the card. Five minutes later, you have the ATM pulling out cash. So imagine the effect this will have on Western Union, MoneyGram, where I go into and I want to transfer money, and they ask me a ridiculous amount of questions, such as, what do you do? What do you study? Where are you from? Why do you need this money? Where are you going to spend it from? Who sent it to you? And all these other questions which really have no place at the end of the day. It's my money and you're just a middleman. You should pass it along. Um, and you can see the effect this has had on the, you know, the underbanked countries such as Morocco. So imagine the effect this will have on countries where they don't have Visa cards or MasterCards, where their banking system doesn't allow them to do this. So they can go online and purchase things. You can buy um, you can even compare it to the event that happened in Greece, where they had the 60 euro daily limit. So if they had bitcoins in that case, there would be no limit. They would be able to do as they wish. I even knew of a person who was in Great Britain at the time, and when it happened, they were unable to use their cards anymore because they did not allow the cash to leave the country. So in the case of bitcoin, it's international currency, anonymous to the most extent if you know how to use it properly, you wouldn't have such issues. And they've also applied this to Wall Street. You know, uh, Patrick Byrne. I hope many of you know him here, I had a conversation with him and his whole concept is that he wants to remove the middleman. Everything he's done is to remove the barriers of the middleman. 
So you allow the person and the customer and the seller to engage in a way where they, they don't feel like uh, they're losing that in the scenario. So he's applied the same concept of the blockchain to the Wall Street, and this is working. This is not a future concept again. This is not something that you will see in 10 years. It's already being done. And it removes naked short selling. It removes double spending, uh, double selling of stocks. <coughs> Imagine the effect this will have on the economy. How many people have lost their jobs because of the Wall Street uh, you know, corruption? Millions of people, millions, a lot of companies. I'm sure you're already aware. And then you have decentralized internet. So you have meshing networks that allow you to create your own network, private networks within areas. They've done this in Argentina up to 16 kilometers, and they've done this in Greece up to 100 kilometers or 60 miles. <coughs> And they've been able to achieve private networks where people share files. You can't tap into it. It's not open to the global uh, network of hackers. So this conditionally changes the aspect. So in rural countries where people cannot afford their own data, they can gather in communities and as a whole contribute to one internet data connection, which then they can distribute throughout the uh, environment between their neighbors and everyone else. So what does this do? It allows you to it allows you to bypass the traditional ISP or government uh, shutdown. So the case in Egypt, where they shut down the internet. Um, having a private network allows information to freely uh, travel through. It allows connection between people, because whoever's part of the network can know each other and move from there. So that was in Argentina. And this is just another example of, uh, I guess, crowdfunding. Um, because a lot of cases they say, you know, who, who would pay for the roads then? Who would pay for such things? Well, this, this was done in Rotterdam. And it, was a great concept and they, they made it work. 8,000 people put 25 euros each and then from there other people stepped in to take it and they built this amazing bridge. And this is just another aspect uh, from one of the biggest banks in the world. You know, The concept of the blockchain, what it does is automates tasks that currently are done by humans and it removes the error. So a lot of jobs, a lot of companies will actually become redundant because simply put, it can be done much better by an algorithm. Um, this is nothing to be feared of because obviously new jobs will uh, stem from it. And yeah, I just want to leave it there. So the whole concept to wrap it up is opening up and making things much more transparent. Realizing that holding on to stuff and being the sole owner is, is, is really not working out. And it's creating a lot of issues. The gentleman before, you know, is speaking about the blockchain and Bitcoin. And I don't like that people refer to it as like, you know, Mirage or something like that, because if you really look at it as a technology and how much it's Excel, you know, it's, it's right now it's worth about 700 US dollars. You tell me something that you have created that's decentralized, doesn't have any authority in the sense of uh, having a boss or ownership that has that much value with 10 billion dollars invested into it. And if you can name one, I would be really open to hearing about it. Um, I won't play that, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening to the concepts. I know there's a lot of different stuff in there and probably, yeah, may get a bit confusing, but I just wanted to give you all the different examples of what's actually happening with the blockchain technology and Bitcoin environment. Cheers. So thank you very much. We'll take again questions who just joined us here. Yeah, no problem. We uh, move on to the uh, next talk. So we'll be coming back to questions that were addressed in the first talk about privacy, but looking at this more from the uh, regulation point of view, so that it's not just something that's nice to have.